verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now underline that in your Bible. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And then it says, to whom he said, this is the rest for with you will cause the weary to rest. And this is a refreshing, yet they would not hear. Okay, so the scripture here begins to start to speak about speaking in tongues. And I've said it for years, is that there's not another subject in the church that is more controversial than speaking in tongues. There's not any other thing in the state of Oregon, in the in all of Canada, in all of the U.S., in any religious church that will fight you more, they will fight you more on tongues than anything else. How many of you notice that? Is that true? Right? So it's the number one thing that religious folks want to argue about. I mean, uh, even, um, how many of you ever heard of John Osteen? Not Joel Osteen, but his father, John. Okay. So John, he actually spoke at my Bible school, Rama, when I went to Rama. And uh, John Osteen, he was so funny. He, he was a Baptist that got filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And all of his Baptist friends saw such a change in his ministry. So they said to him, they said, well, we see it in your life. We see you have more power in your life and more power in your ministry. And so we want the baptism, but we don't want the tongue sing. So John said, you ever bought a new pair of shoes? He goes, the tongue comes with the shoe. <laughs> if you get, you get the Holy Ghost, you get the tongues, right, with the Holy Ghost. Come on, right? So... That's why I, I want to start here, um, because this is kind of where I began. I was going to share this the last session, but I felt like uh, I needed to kind of flip-flop. So go over to the New Testament. I shared some of this at uh, Dominion Life in Plano a few years ago, and uh, some of you have seen that video. But if you have your Bibles, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14. So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. So even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. Everyone say, my spirit prays. So your spirit, man, is praying. But my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion, man? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding. Now there's a lot going on in here. So in verses 12 and 13, Paul the Apostle begins to start to speak about tongues. And in the same moment he's talking about speaking in tongues, he talks about interpreting it. Right? So as he talks about interpreting, he even says, pray that you may interpret. And so um, then in verse 14, Paul begins to say this. Listen, when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. Everyone say, my spirit prays. So your spirit man begins to pray. That's why your understanding is, is, is you know, your, your understanding isn't getting it. But your spirit man is praying. So your spirit man is getting it. Just like this. Let me say it like this. When you speak, uh, when you sleep at night, you know, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. But when you sleep, your body is at rest, and your soul is at rest. True? But your spirit is not sleeping. Your spirit is still in contact with God. And that's why when you, when you sleep at night and you dream... Your spirit is getting a message from God. According to Job chapter 33, it says God speaks this way or in another way in a dream or in a vision of the night. So God is speaking to your spirit a dream. And what your spirit is doing is it's getting this message that's encrypted by the Holy Spirit. And it's getting this message and it's conveying it to your soul. And as you wake up, you say, oh, I had a dream. How many of you ever did that? Come on, raise your hand. Okay. All right. So you had this dream. Then how many of you said, I'll remember the dream in the morning? 
How come you laugh? Because you don't remember the dream, do you? Right? That's why in the book of Daniel, Daniel said seven times, he said, I wrote the dream. Because Daniel said this, that dreams are fleeting. So for every 10 minutes you wait to write your dream down, you lose about 10% of the dream. It's like, it's like holding ice. I mean, there's a time limit to this, you understand? You can't just hold ice forever because it's beginning to melt the moment it hits your hand. And it's very much the same thing is true with a dream. So you have all these details of a prophetic dream. Oh Lord, let me not get into that now today, but... But I, I just got to convey this to you, that you, you get all of these details, and it's your spirit is da -da 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 it's giving messages to your soul. And as it's conveying these messages and imagery to your soul, you're like, oh, I had this crazy dream, and your husband says, go back to sleep. It was just a lasagna. <laughs> right? When in actuality, it's your spirit in connection with God. And your spirit is getting this message that has to be interpreted. But it's conveying it to your soul, and your soul is like, I don't understand what this means. But in your spirit, you're like, yeah, it makes sense. Come on, is that true? Right? Okay. So here, now, Paul says this in verse 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, he says, now my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. That's why, you know, many people I've met have been filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken tongues, and then they don't continue praying in the Spirit, and as a result, what happens is, is that it's almost like that well dries up. I don't know a better terminology to give you. Okay? So, and then it's like you've got to get them refilled again because they thought that, you know, they only prayed in tongues when they felt it in church. Because that's what many people have been taught. You can only pray in tongues, you know, when the light is just right, and the music is just right, and all conditions are just A-OK, -okay and <laughs> you understand? But you can pray in tongues at will. You can pray in tongues at will. You don't have to wait for a leading. Paul doesn't say, I feel to pray in tongues. He says, I will. Just like this morning, you willed to brush your teeth. Well, the neighbor next to you hopes you did, at least. Right? So you didn't say, well, I have to be led by the Spirit before I'll brush my teeth. No, you just said, I will do this. You said, I will brush my hair, or whatever it might be, right? So you just did it by your will. Is that true? Okay, so now Paul begins to bring up the same thing in verse 15. Paul says, for what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will. Now, notice he says it four times in one verse. I will. I will. My will. Not God's will. My will. Right? And so Paul says, I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. Well, in 1988, I was uh, an associate pastor. I, I started very young in ministry. I was 19 when I started. And so I, I started very young in ministry. And so as I, I did, I'm, by the time I was 24, I started my first church. And so I, in starting very, very young in ministry and stuff, I was an associate pastor in 1988. So in 1988, I'm an associate pastor. And I'm struggling with this thing with the voice of God. And so as I'm struggling with this thing with the voice of God, I would often stay up late at night and read my Bible. And I was always a late bird, and so I would have my time with the Lord late at night. And every night, I would, before I would fall asleep, I would begin to hear that scripture in my heart. I would begin to hear, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding. So literally for two weeks... I read that verse every single day for two full weeks, over two full weeks. Well, it was winter time, and uh, I don't know for Oregon. Do you guys get snow here? Okay, sometimes. All right. Well, this was in New Jersey, and they don't often get snow, but this that year it was cold. And so here I am, the associate pastor, and so I get a phone call early on a Sunday morning 
from the senior pastor and says, the guy who picks up people for church uh, went, out, went away on vacation, forgot to tell anybody. So you got to do it. <laughs> That's the job of the associate pastor, right? And uh, so I was frustrated. I was frustrated with him. I know none of you holy people have ever been frustrated, praise the Lord. But I got frustrated. How many of you ever been frustrated? Come on, be honest. Okay, cool. Otherwise, we've got to pray for liars here next. So I was frustrated. I was frustrated with God about hearing his voice because I kept crying out saying, Lord, I want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to hear your voice. And uh, all I would hear is that, that verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. And I heard that for two and a half weeks in my heart. And so I just kept reading that verse every single day. So I get in the church van to go get the people, and the church van is freezing cold. <laughs> The steering wheel is freezing. I get in, the thing barely turns over. And so I drive to the very first house to pick up the first family. And as I pull up into their driveway, the husband runs out in his boxer shorts and his hair all crazy. He goes, we overslept, give us 15 minutes. And I was already frustrated. <laughs> By now I'm on next level of the flesh. You understand? So now I'm complaining to God, okay? So now I'm irritated. I'm like, God, you know what? I'm irritated with people in the church that don't help and blah, 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 blah. And then I said, and you know what, Lord? I said, you already know what I'm thinking. And I said, I'm irritated with you too because I'm wanting to hear your voice and I don't hear your voice like I want. And I just sat there quietly for a minute just waiting for these people to come out and I hear in my spirit, I hear 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I'm like... God, I know what that says. I've been reading that for two and a half weeks. And now back in those days, we didn't have cell phones, so I reached in my pocket and I had a Gideon's little New Testament. So I pull out a little Gideon's New Testament, and I'm like, okay, God, here's what it says. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. And I heard the voice of the Lord. He said, stop. That is a pattern of prayer. And I said, what? He said, that is a pattern of prayer. You pray in the spirit, and then you interpret it at your own will. Please get this tonight. Are you with me? Shake your neighbor, say, wake up. Okay, you got to get this, okay? So I said, Lord, I, I don't understand. I'm sa I said, you mean I can just... By my own will, like I can pray in tongues, I can pray the interpretation. And I didn't hear anything. And so I'm looking at that scripture. It said, I will. So I said, all right. I said, uh, I have to go get the pastor's um, youth from youth camp tonight. And so I said, I'm going to practice on them. So I'm going to sit here for the next, I said, I got 10 minutes till these people get out of bed, brush their teeth, and come to church. So I said, I'm going to pray for the next minute for the boy, pray in tongues, and then I'm going to interpret whatever comes to my mind. And then I said, I'm going to do the same with the girl. And so I began to do that with the boy, and I wrote it down, what I got. I forget what it was. But then I, I did the same with the girl. And I remember with the girl, I saw the girl in a picture in my mind. I saw her in a roller coaster stuck in the bottom, and she couldn't get out. And I prophesied, I, I interpreted out loud, I said, the reason she's stuck in there is there's three reasons she can't break out of this rut that she is in. And so I just wrote it down on the piece of paper. And so then I went to the youth camp to go get these kids. The boy's about 17, the girl's about 15. And so I said to them, I said, I was praying for you this morning. And I said to the boy, I said, this is what I felt like God said. And the moment I said it, the boy just starts weeping. And I said to the girl, I said, I was praying for you, and this is what the Lord said. You are in, like in a roller coaster, stuck in the bottom, and you can't get out of this spiritual rut. And I said, there's three reasons you're stuck in there. Boom, boom, boom. And as I said that, the girl came undone. She said, I sat on the edge of my bed at camp this morning, and I said, God, I feel like I'm on a roller coaster stuck in the bottom. The exact action, come on somebody, that I did just like this. 
and I knew at that moment that I was on to something. And I began to find myself pray in the Spirit and interpret it. And I began to do so from 1988 all the way up until now. Here we are, whatever, whatever that is, 30 years later. So here I am 30 years later, and I've been praying in the Spirit and interpreting it. Well, before that, um, in 1991, I was a pastor in California. And so I was in Modesto, California as a pastor. And uh, we had a guest minister in by the name of Billy Brim. Anyone ever heard of Billy Brim? Oh, wow, many of you guys don't. Okay. If you don't know this, Billy Brim's great-grandmother was one of the very first people filled with the Holy Spirit in 1901. When Charles Parham had the, uh, um, the revival there in Topeka, Kansas, and 44 people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, her grandmother was one of the first 44 people baptized in the Holy Spirit uh, five years before Azusa Street. And so, uh, so Billy comes from a long history of, and so Billy said, and stuff like that. So Billy comes to minister at her church, and so Billy said, Tom, will you guys take me to my next meeting? I have to go see Kenneth Hagin in San Francisco. And so it was about a two hour plus drive and I said, sure, we'll take you. And so we get in the van and we're driving on the way there and it gets quiet and I said, Billy, I gotta share something with you. I tell her this story and she starts laughing. She says, you know who one of my best friends was? I said, who? She said, Ger Gertrude Wright. And Gertrude Wright said, the number one way God spoke to John G. Lake was through tongues and interpretation in his own private everyday life. She said, even over the meal, he would pray in tongues and interpret it. And she said, we never got a hot meal. <laughs> Dad is prophesying over the nations, laying hands on the kids and prophesying over the kids and interpreting it in tongues and everything else. And, and so she said, uh, um, Billy said to me in 1991, she said, have you ever heard of Oral Roberts? I said, well, of course. And she said, this is how Oral Roberts built his whole ministry, praying in tongues and interpreting it. She said, you're taking me to go see Kenneth Hagin. You ever heard of Kenneth Hagin? I said, of course. <laughs> she said, that's how Kenneth Hagin built his whole ministry, praying in tongues, come on church, and interpreting it. And so this is how the Holy Spirit began with me is through jump-starting me. I call it spiritual training wheels. Like spiritual training wheels is where we can pray in the Spirit and interpret it. We have so many believers that are today think nothing of praying in the Spirit. Just like in the last session, I told you, I said, all right, everyone stand up and pray in the Holy Ghost. So everyone did it. We didn't have to check with God. We didn't have to pray and say, Lord, if it be thy will. And Lord, if we feel a little smitherinkdom or whatever it might be. <laughs> Come on, right? But we went and we did it at our Will. We just did it at our own will. By our will, we prayed in the Spirit. Well, guess what? The exact same way that you prayed in the Spirit, you can also pray in the Spirit and interpret it to yourself every single day, no matter who you, or where you are or what you're doing, whether it's in a ministry setting or just for your own per personal life, praying in the Spirit and interpreting it. And I believe that this is what the Holy Spirit, and I've been sharing this for 30 years, literally for 30 years. I remember 30 years ago sharing it, and people thought, whoo he's out there. They had never even heard that before. And, you know, then, then in the, the early 90s, you know, with the, the books of God's generals, then more and more people began to be aware of people like Lake and stuff like that. And, and uh, But even up until now, the majority of believers, if you talk the majority of Christians, and, and there's a lot of churches represented here this afternoon, is that the majority of believers do not regularly pray in the Spirit and interpret. They may do it once, twice, three times a year, or maybe once, two, three times a decade, but not on a consistent basis. But I, I just felt like in this session, I was just praying. I just said, Lord, you know, what, what direction, where, where do we need to go next? And that's just what I really felt in my heart, is that the Lord is wanting to jumpstart the church. So here's the question that the majority of people have in praying in tongues and interpreting it. Yeah, Tom, but it sounds like me. Right? That's the number one question I have people say. It sounds like me. Well, my, my answer to that is this, is if it sounds like Tom Scarella, then you probably need deliverance. 
Of course, it's going to sound like you. Come on, right? It's going to sound like you. So go over, uh, hold your place here because we're coming back to 1 Corinthians 14. But in 1 Corinthians 6, I believe this will really help you. 1 Corinthians 6. So 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Circle it, put stars around it, whatever you got to do. So 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, But he that is joined to the Lord is what? One spirit with him. So you're not two separate spirits, but you're one spirit. So if you're one spirit with him, then, of course, it's got to sound like you. Right? So here we are, full circle back at the scripture again that I started with at the last session, that we have God's thoughts and we know God's ways. Why? Because here the scripture says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. I'm one spirit with Christ. Everyone say that out loud. I'm one spirit with Christ. Come on, say it one more time. Okay, so you are one spirit with Christ. So as you are one with Christ, of course, it's got to sound like you. Right? And so, but you, just like everything else in the kingdom operates by faith, you have to do it by faith. That's why Paul says, I will. I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. He doesn't say, I feel. No, no, no. Feel is not in there. It's will. It's at my will. I activate it. Natural first. Right? So the moment you begin to just do it by faith, it's like in that place, God meets you in that place. How many of you receive that? Is that, is that helping anybody here this afternoon, right? Okay, so, so that's, that's, that, that, that's just a word from the Lord for all of us is that it's at our will. It's connected to our will. And the moment we begin to keep practicing it that way, you'll begin to find yourself ministering prophetically to people and God is showing you insights and supernatural things just by praying in the Spirit and interpreting it. Right? Praying in the Spirit and interpreting it. Now go, go back in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians 14, in verse uh, 6. Now in verse 6, it talks about four different ways of speaking in tongues. So in verse 6, it says this. It says, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues... What shall I profit you? Now here Paul's going to give us four different ways. What shall I profit you if I either speak to you by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? So Paul says, I'm going to speak to you. If I come speaking in tongues, I've got to come speaking in tongues in one of those four ways. How? Here he gives it to us. He says, number one is by revelation. So what happens? As you pray in tongues and you interpret it, you have revelation that comes forth. Often you'll begin to speak a, a teaching or you'll, you'll prophesy something to yourself that is absolutely revealed that was not known before. Right? Many of the teachings of Lake, if you notice almost every single one of the teachings of Lake always ends with a prophecy, excuse me, tongues and interpretation. <laughs> How many of you ever noticed that in many of his, his books, right? The same thing is true with Kenneth Hagin. I, I was in his Bible school. He spoke in tongues and, prophes and, and interpreted it. And as he would interpret it, that's where most of his uh, uh, revelation of the word began to come from. Okay? And then it begins to bring forth a second one. What is the second one it says? Whoops. Knowledge. So now... Knowledge is unlocked. So how is knowledge unlocked? Ah, by praying in tongues. And in, you hear Paul is saying, I, I can come to you pray, uh, by speaking in tongues and giving knowledge. Okay, number three, he says, prophesying, right? So what do we know of, of, of prophecy? Prophecy is equal to tongues and interpretation, right? We know that by the previous verses. And, and the last one is by teaching. So we can actually gain teaching. God can teach us things supernaturally by praying in the Spirit and interpreting it. Many of the things that we're doing in the ministry today is by praying in the Spirit 
and interpreting it. Praying in the Spirit and interpreting it. And it's just like anything else in the kingdom, you get better at it by practice. Everyone say practice. You know, like I was saying there in Salem, you know, Michael Jordan did become the, you know, the greatest basketball player ever, but he just woke up one day and he just had that, you know, whatever. No, he, he practiced, right? So things natural or spiritual begin to, you grow by practice. The same thing is true of things of the Spirit. We begin to practice, and the more we begin to practice, it's like something begins to happen, a, a confidence, a boldness begins to, to happen to all of us. And that boldness is unlocked the moment that we begin to continue, by continual repetition, begin to practice. The more you begin to practice praying in the Spirit and interpreting it. Now, I, I mean, I've done this with uh, people of all different walks, brand new Christians, baby Christians, uh, believers who've been saved for many, many years, uh, and, and, and I've taught them in a matter of minutes, I say, you can do this. Just pray in tongues and interpret it. How do I interpret it, Tom? The very first thoughts that come to you as you pray in tongues are those from the Holy Spirit. He begins to use your thoughts, those thoughts that begin to come into your mind as you are praying in the Spirit. You know, that's why I tell people, don't just babble in tongues, but purposefully speak in tongues and as you begin to purposefully speak in tongues, now expect the interpretation because that is a true language. Right? So you begin to do so very purposely, very aimedly. So I began to do that, that exact same thing. And uh, I, I remember uh, we were uh, ministering in Puerto Rico. And uh, we were ministering in this religious church. Oh, God, deliver me from religious churches like that. We're in this, uh, such a religious church in, uh, right outside of San Juan. And we were getting ready to go to the other side of the island to go minister in this other church. And um, we uh, got a phone call from the other pastor, and they were all freaked out because my wife didn't have a dress, so God forbid, you know, how, how could the Holy Spirit use a woman without a dress on? And uh, <laughs> I say that sarcastically. So... Um, so we began to pray in the Spirit, and then as we began to pray in the Spirit and interpret it, the Lord began to speak to me that there's another pastor. So I called that pastor back. I said, we're supposed to come to your city. And the, the pastor said, yeah, there's another church they meet in a casino. I'm like, that's the church. <laughs> and so we went to that church, and we went and we ministered. And, and as we ministered there, I actually ministered a little bit along these lines. And that night, it was a powerful night, and people were baptized in the Holy Ghost, and God just moved through there like a tornado. It was just amazing. And uh, people slain in the Spirit, the power of God hitting people, and people healed and stuff. And this old lady came up to me, very, very old lady came up to me, and she was weeping and crying. And she said, uh, in the early 1900s, she said, I was a little girl. And she said, as a little girl, the first people that came from Azusa Street, they came with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and this is what the meetings look like right here. She said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Amen. She said, I haven't seen that in over 80 years, she said, since I was a little girl. Amen. That's exactly what it looked like. What did they do? They prayed in tongues and interpreted it. I mean, if you do any research at all, Agnes Osmond on January 1st of 1901, when she was baptized in the Holy Spirit in Topeka, Kansas, she spoke in perfect Mandarin Chinese for three days and wrote in tongues. And then wrote the interpretation as well in perfect Mandarin Chinese. And here this woman could barely read and write in English. <laughs> Linguists came from all over the world and began to say, this is perfect Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> Come on, amen. And her interpretation was absolutely, perfectly accurate. <laughs> so the early believers in the early 1900s, they believed that if you prayed in tongues, you could also write in tongues. How about that? Put that in your religious pipe and smoke it, huh? How about that one? That'll freak your brain out, huh? But that's, that's how the early days, that's how the people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Lake and all of those guys, when they were filled with the Spirit, they believed they not only could speak in tongues, but they could also write in tongues. And write the interpretation. Hallelujah. <laughs> so don't, 
don't, don't clam up on me, all right? But I challenge you, look it up. Look it up on Google, Agnes Osmond, Writing in Tongues. And you'll see there's pictures of it in, 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 in some of the documents that she wrote and stuff and the interpretation. So praise God. So go back to your left. Go back to Isaiah. So in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah 11 says it like this, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Then it says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you'll cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Everyone say refreshing. So here he says, listen, this is the refreshing. So speaking in tongues also brings a refreshing. There's a refreshing that begins to come uh, in, in speaking in tongues. And so the, the one thing, as we speak in tongues and as we interpret it, we are interpreting the very mind of the Lord, whether back to ourselves or for other people. Now, I've said this for years. You can also journal it down. Some of you are better at journaling. So you don't have to speak it. You can write it, the interpretation. This is what God is saying. Boom. And remember what I said the last session. The natural is first. So the moment you grab the pen, you just believe that God is showing you exactly what to write. Amen. And then that's the voice of God. The Lord is speaking to you through that. And you can share that with other people. Now, I gave a testimony in Salem, but um, I forgot all about this. But several years ago when we were living in Florida, I traveled and I ministered to my old home state of Minnesota. And I went up there to minister in the dead of winter. I don't know what I was thinking, but in January we went to Minnesota. That wasn't too smart in 35 below zero. <laughs> And so we were ministering in Minnesota, and uh, I was preaching about the voice of God. I was preaching about sonship. I was preaching about walking in our identity. I was pre preaching about healing. And so the one night, um, the service went till rather late. It was about 1030, quarter to 11, whatever. And I told the people, I said, grab a piece of paper. God's going to speak to you now. So everyone grabbed a piece of paper. I said, split up all over the church. So everyone split up all over the church. And I said, you're going to take the next two minutes, and God's going to show you two people that you are going to connect with and minister to, and you are going to have a word from the Lord for them or minister healing to them. Go. <laughs> and they began to write down. They were like, oh, God, please, Jesus. You know, I mean, they're like emergency tongues almost. You know, Lord, please. And so they began to just, people began to write down. Now, I forgot all about this. This is about five, six years ago. And uh, a few months ago, I was at a conference, and a lady stopped me. She, as I was walking out to my book table, she said, oh, she said, Tom Scarella. She said, do you remember me? I said, no. I said, I'm sorry. And she said, well, you came up here, and you spoke in this church. And she said, um, she reminded me of that service. I said, yeah, I remember that service. She said, well, the weirdest thing is, I began to pray in the spirit, and I had a picture in my mind of two attorneys, both of them going through marriage difficulties, and I wrote their names down on the paper. And she said, at the end of the service, I thought you were just going to let us go home. But she said, you told us, go just pick any place you want, pick a hospital, pick a bar, pick a, a restaurant, or pick a gas station, and just walk in. And look for the people that's on your piece of paper. And I remembered saying that. And she said, I grabbed my girlfriend and I said, listen, God spoke to me about two attorneys in a bar. And they said, I, I got the same thing. Look at it. And they showed each other and they were shocked they had the same thing. So they got in the car. It was snowing out, 35 below zero. And they drive to this bar in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. And they go into the bar in this smoke-filled bar, and they open the door, and there's only two guys sitting at the bar. And these two women walked up to these two guys, and they said, we just came from a conference where we were praying at this church, and God sent us to you. You both are attorneys. Your names are whatever they were, Aaron and something else. And something's going on in your marriage. And the one guy goes, my wife sent you here, didn't she? Yeah, she's one of those church ladies, they said. And uh, here, both of them, their wives had just gotten born again. 
and the wives are crying out to God to speak to their husbands. Come on, somebody. And these two women led both those guys to Christ in the bar. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. How did that happen? It happened by the voice of God. It happened as they just took the pen, the natural first. Everyone say natural first. Natural. When they just said, I will. Right? When they said that in their mind, I will. What? What does Paul say? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. Right? And so the moment they just said that, all right, I'm going to do it. God, you're going to speak right now. Boom. And the moment they did that, God spoke to them and through them. And those two attorneys are still born again here all these years later. <laughs> Come on. Amen. And we've seen that happen so many different times. I can't even tell you how many encounters with God that we've had similar to that. One after another after another uh, where people have just had incredible God encounters of hearing God's voice. Just the moment they activate it. What activated it? You know what activated it? Their own hunger. What activated it? Their own will. And the moment they begin to step into that, I think so too often that people are just, you know, waiting for this, like I said earlier, something spectacular instead of just expecting the supernatural. And instead of just expecting the supernatural, that, all right, God, you want to speak through me. Just like, exactly like if I said, all right, let's everybody go heal the sick. All right, ready? Go. You wouldn't have to say, yeah, but I got to be led. I got to be led. I got to be led. You would just say, I'm just going to go pick somebody. You understand? Right? And just in doing that, you could do the exact same thing as far as in giving somebody a word from the Lord. You can activate it by faith. You can activate the prophetic by faith. There's several things I, I wrote down here that... that uh, uh, prophecy does. Prophecy does so, so many different things. Um, I, I wrote these down. You, could write, you can write them down if you want to. Number one, what, is, what does prophecy do? Prophecy does this. It restores people's relationship with God. It restores that relationship with God. It brings full restoration. It brings that person into restoration with God, number one. Number two, what does it do? It encourages that, encourages that person not to give up or faint. You get a prophetic word, it's like right in time. How many of you ever got a prophetic word and it was like perfect timing? Raise your hand. Anybody? Right? And what does it do? It brings that encouragement. It brings that encouragement and, and, and it, it just brings that encouragement and it just says don't give up, don't faint. Right? Number three, prophecy gives direction or it even enhances our vision. It gives direction, or it even will enhance our vision. Right? Number four, prophecy will confirm the word. Prophecy will begin to confirm the word. Often, pro let, let me just be honest with you. Prophecy is often in the word that's preached. Right? So like when Curry was preaching in the first two sessions this morning, I have not spoken to him since I saw him this morning. I saw him this morning. I said hello, hugged him, and then he got up and preached. He had no idea. He took a big chunk of what I was going to say in the first session. <laughs> so how did he do that? He picked it up in the spirit, right? So even through the preaching of the word, there is prophecy. So prophecy doesn't have to just be with, yea, thus saith the Lord. Come on. Right? Prophecy can be just through the word. Sometimes prophecy can be through the worship. If you really have a hearing ear, you'll see a thread through worship. There'll be a thread, a common message is right through the worship, and God is saying the same thing, and then the preacher will get up and start preaching the exact same thing. Well, if you would have listened during the worship, you would have heard, hey, God was speaking the same thing, and then confirmed it through the word. Amen? So, uh, let's see, what number am I on? So number four, prophecy confirms the preaching of the word. Number five, prophecy opens hearts for evangelism and discipleship. What does it do? Prophecy opens up hearts for evangelism and discipleship. 
Simple prophecy just opens up people. I mean, their heart just opens up. Like the girl you just yesterday down there in, in, in uh, Salem, when I was in Salem, met her, th this lady in the park. Here she is eating lunch, and uh, she's there. She's depressed. Boom, I walked up to her. I began to prophesy to her. As soon as I started prophesying to her, shoo, the tears started. I mean, the tears just started running down this woman's face, you know? And she just soft. She was like, she, she was just like a puddle <laughs> in a matter of a minute of just me prophesying over her. And then I prayed for her to be healed and stuff. And, and, and here she was healed and, and, and got all this supernatural ministry. And so at the end, I just asked her, do you want to receive Jesus now as your Lord? She's like, yeah. <laughs> She's got makeup running everywhere. She looked crazy. Her makeup was everywhere, you know. But how did that happen? Prophecy opens up evangelism. I, I have a prophet friend. He, uh, he went and he got in an airplane to go minister in Dubai. And he's a prophet. And so he went to go to Dubai to go minister. And, and so as he went to go to Dubai, to, to Dubai he sat next to this, Muslim, uh, to, to this Hindu guy. And this Hindu guy had a god with him, small g. And it was this little idol, right? And uh, so uh, my prophet friend William went and started to say to him, he prophesied to him his name, his birth date, his daughter's name, his wife's name. I mean, the guy is freaking out. He's like, did you see it on my ticket here or something like that? How do you know these things, you know? And he said, my God speaks. Here's the difference between my God and your idol. My God speaks. He's, de he's dumb. He can't speak. By the end, here this Hindu guy goes and gives his heart to Jesus on the plane. Come on, somebody. Amen. So number five is, is it opens hearts for evangelism and uh, discipleship. Number six, prophecy causes thanksgiving. Causes people to become thankful. The moment you get a prophetic word or you release a prophetic word to somebody, it's just like thankfulness. Oh, thank you, thank you, I needed that. It's just like a cool drink. I say it like this. Just like we say, uh, you know, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words, I say it like this. One prophetic word is like a thousand sermons. One prophetic word, shoo, I mean, it just goes so deep in the heart. It's like a thousand sermons at once into that person's life, right? So it causes thanksgiving. Uh, what am I on, number seven? Okay, so number seven. Prophecy can even bring forth teaching or a new revelation of the word. Prophecy. Often, as a person prophesies, often there's an element of uh, revelation in it. There's an element of revelation, prophecy. There's an element, this element of revelation. You know, even speaking of revelation, you know, the book of revelation is a book of prophecy. You know, and, and, and how did John get it in the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation, it says this. I think 21 times John says, I saw or I see. 21 times he says, I saw, I saw, I saw. So how did God speak? Through his, through what he saw, right? So often people begin to hear better through their eyes than they do through their ears, Right? So we hear God's voice, we often hear better, even through our eyes, through what we see. I see, I see this over your life. I see this is what God is saying. Amen? Okay, so uh, whatever number, eight. Number eight, prophecy gives fuel for leaders to carry on in spite of controversy or conflict. Often leaders need to have a prophetic word just of encouragement. Not of things that they don't know, but of just things that they do know. You understand? Often prophecy carries this, and it brings encouragement to leaders. Number nine. That is number, this is number nine now, right now. Okay, right. Prophecy creates a heart not to be insecure, but rather transparent and receptive. Prophecy creates a heart not to be insecure, but transparent and receptive. So when you prophesy to somebody, what happens is, is you cause them to become transparent because God spoke to them so they even more want to become more and more vulnerable to the Spirit of God. 
that want to become more and more transparent to, to the Spirit as well as to people. Number 10, prophecy makes people feel like they're known by God. Right? Prophecy instantly makes people feel like they're known by God. God knows where they are. God knows what's going on. So that's what prophecy does. Prophecy does those things in, in, in people. And prophecy we see not just starting in the last hundred years since people are being filled with the Spirit, but even all the way back to the book of Acts, even in the early church. Um, I've shared this before, but, you know, even people, you know, in the first couple hundred years of Christianity, I mean, people were still prophesying. Even uh, uh, St. Patrick. I was talking about St. Patrick last night. How many of you ever heard of St. Patrick, right? Okay, St. Patrick, one, I mean, a radical guy. I mean, St. Patrick probably did more miracles than, than John G. Lake ever did. I mean, he raised like 400 people from the dead. Some of the people that uh, St. Patrick raised from the dead had been dead for years. Two and three and four years been dead in the ground, and he'd raise them up from the dead. <laughs> hey, that'll clear your sinuses real quick, won't it? Man, Grandma's been gone for four years. There she is walking around. What in the world? You know? And so, I mean, here, you know, we have uh, St. Patrick, and he would prophesy and he took on the Druids of the day and where we get Halloween and all of that stuff. And, and so uh, here St. Patrick comes along and, and he took on Druidism and all of that stuff. And, and he did it through the prophetic, through the prophetic word. And, uh, um, and, and it was, he would often prophesy. In fact, the one time with him when he went back to Ireland for the first time after many years, St. Patrick went and, and uh, when he went back to Ireland... He got off the boat, and when he got off the boat, they said he took a staff, and he drove it into the ground in front of like 500 people. And he said, never will a snake live again on the island of Ireland. And when he said that, oh, I mean, thousands of snakes, you know, slithered their way into the ocean and killed themselves. And on Ireland, you cannot find a snake anywhere, anywhere left on the entire island. <laughs> Come on, amen. Come on. Right? So how did he do that? Through the prophetic word. Through the prophetic word, he just prophesied it. I mean, we got so many other great men and women of God. Joan of Arc. I mean, here she was. She, she put, you know, 16-year-old little girl, illiterate girl. She couldn't read or write. And here she is illiterate, and she put fear in the king of England. <laughs> she led the armies of France through nothing but the voice of God. That's all she had was the voice of God, and she absolutely thwarted the strongest army on the face of the earth through nothing but the voice of God. And she would prophesy and exactly what she said would come to pass. I mean, we could go all the way through church history. We could go through uh, uh, even the, what they called the Presbyterian prophets. I think it was in the 1400s. You could go uh, uh, all the way through uh, the 1700s with John and Charles Wesley and, and George Whitfield and all of those guys, and they would begin to prophesy. And you know, George, uh, 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 Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. George Whitfield was used in our country to put on your money in God we trust. That came through a prophetic word. He prophesied that. And so they changed what they were going to put on our money because of a prophetic word from a man of God. <laughs> Come on. 250 years later, it's still on your money. Amen. In our country, so many of the things that we, we, we celebrate and we have right now are because of the voice of God with our early church fathers, right? Right? So I believe that the day that we're in right now, God is saying to the church, come on now, church. It's time not any longer to just take notes. It's time for you to rise up as the sons of God and begin to start to prophesy. That you would begin to start to prophesy and minister as Christ wherever it is that you go. And the moment that we begin to start to do that, all of a sudden we begin to start to, instead of going and looking for a prophet, we become the prophet. Right? Instead of going and running trying to go get a word, we're giving a word. Amen? It's a different mindset. Instead of just running to go get healing, now we're the ones doing the ministering healing. Now we're the ones healing the sick. Right? It's a different mindset. So often we have right now in charismatic circles in our country, people are running to go get a word here and get a word there. 
You know, instead of saying, I want to go give a word. I want to be the one that, that releases the word. I want to be the one that ministers the word, right? And uh, so let's do this. In fact, I want to do this. I want you to grab your Bibles. Go back to 1 Corinthians just for a few minutes here. 1 Corinthians 14. So 1 Corinthians 14. So in verse 1, it says this. So he gives us the key in verse 1. So he says, pursue love or follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. The word desire there, circle it, it means to lust and crave after. It means to lust and crave after spiritual gifts, it says, right? But especially that you may, what? Prophesy, right? For he that speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak unto men, but unto God. For no one understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks, what? Mysteries, or in the Greek it says divine secrets. So when you speak in tongues, what are you speaking? Mysteries and divine secrets. So what if you interpreted the mysteries and divine secrets? Now all of a sudden you're unveiling things that have not been previously revealed. Instead of just being lost, you're all of a sudden releasing that. Okay, so verse 3 is where I'm trying to get to. In verse 3 it says, But he that prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. I'll say it again. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. So simple prophecy it has no revelation in it. Simple prophecy is... Edification, exhortation, comfort. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Everyone, just for a minute, stand to your feet. All right, <clears throat> this is what you're going to do. Turn to the person next to you, grab their two hands. Don't make a chain, one person, face them, two hands. One person, one person. You understand? So it should just be two people holding hands, okay? Just two people holding hands. You understand? All right? Okay, now here's what you're going to do. Here's, the, here's your exercise. You're going to tell that person two things that you love about that person. Go for it. Two of your favorite things you like about that person. <laughs> awesome. Give them a big hug, will you? Give them a great big hug, will you? Raise your hand if you feel better right now. Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. Now, don't sit down yet. Listen to me. Listen to me a second. That encouraging word has an element or the DNA of prophecy. Just simple prophecy has no revelation in it other than edification, exhortation, comfort. So just speaking that kind word, what does it do? Is, is it got the same DNA or the same characteristics of prophecy? All right? So, okay, find someone else next to you. Turn to another person. Same thing, all right? Just speak a couple of words of encouragement. Just a couple things you like about that person. Might be their smile, their hair, whatever.
All right. Well, bless you guys. You can be seated. <clears throat> All right. So here's, just sit down just for a second. I'm just, we're going to wrap this up in a few minutes. We're going to do some ministry and... <clears throat> So here's my question to you, okay? How did the early church survive in the early church? How did they survive without this? They could not walk around carrying the book of Ephesians or the book of Colossians or the book of Galatians. Some of them had never seen the book of Thessalonians. Come on. True? True? How did they do it? How did that, those in Corinth had never heard the book of Romans. Those that were in Rome, they had never heard the book of Corinthians or the books of Corinthians. Come on. Those in, those in, those in Philippi, they had never heard of the, uh, or they had never read the, 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 the letter to the Colossians. You understand? So how did they, how did they do it? You know how they did it? They functioned entirely by the voice of God. They function. Everything that they did was entirely by the Word of God. I remember we had some people come to my church when I used to be a pastor. And when these people came to our church, they came from the underground church. Uh, they, were, they had been in, in like Siberia or something like that, somewhere in Russia. And these people, they came to our church. This is way back in the 80s. And when they came to our church... The, the, the gentleman was speaking. He had nine children. He was married. And uh, as they, they were, they were involved in the underground church. And they began to say to us, they said, we had, they had a little over 300 people in their underground church. And they had one page of the book of John, chapter 1. That's all they had. But they knew about the gifts of the Spirit. They knew about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Everything out of John 1. And one day a year, everyone in the church got to hold the Bible, the one page of John chapter 1. That was a treasure for one day a year. You got to hold it. You got to be with, you got to have it for one day of the year. So the gentleman that was speaking in our church, he began to tell us, he said, one day our pastor got up and said to our people, said <clears throat> that there are wolves amongst the sheep. And so from now on, you will have to pray about who is preaching, where the meetings will be held, and what time the meetings will be. At the end of the meeting, he was arrested and he was killed. The pastor was. And so the gentleman that was in our church speaking got up and he said, I said to my wife and nine children, he said, we have to pray and find out where we're meeting next. So he said, so we begin to pray as a family. We begin to pray in the spirit. And he said, an interpretation came 2 a.m. on Tuesday morning in a barn in the middle of the field. And he said it was a winter storm that night. At 2 a.m., he said, I gather my family up, my nine children, gathered them all up, and we walked across this field, this open field to this semi-abandoned barn. And he said, and we opened the door, and when we opened the door, there were 300 people saying, we are here, we're waiting for you, you're preaching. <laughs> Come on, somebody, give the Lord a hand clap, amen. I mean, what if we began to start to think in terms of that? What if we began to start to say, man, God, I gotta hear your voice. I have to push myself, I have to stretch my spirit. You know, Curry was talking about going to the gym. You know, the only way muscles grow is by resistance, Right? So what if you begin to start to push yourself spiritually? You know, I, I, I go to the gym a little bit. Not very much, but I should. I should go a lot more. But yeah, I, one day I was in the gym, and there was this guy, and he's doing curls, and he's talking on his cell phone. And I'm like, dude, you might as well not even work out because there's no resistance there. Your muscles are not growing. You're wasting your time. 
And it was like God used that to speak to me. He said, that's how many in the church are. They never push their, self, their, their, their spirit, man, to grow. And so they're stuck in that place of infancy, of that place of spiritual growth. So they never grow beyond where they were. Now let me just tell you something. You do not grow by information. You grow by application. See, you do not grow by information, gaining information. You actually grow by application. Jesus said it like this. He talked about meat. How many of you have heard of milk and meat in the scriptures? Okay, I'm going to settle this once and for all. The, the milk of the word is what you hear. The meat of the word is what you do. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. So the meat is not what you hear. Come on, somebody. People say, I want the meat. I want the meat. I don't want to hear milk. Well, you don't hear meat. You do meat. It's the application. John Wimber used to say down here in Southern California, he used to say this. He used to say, the meat is in the streets. It means that the meat is the application. So it's not just in the hearing that you're getting meat. No, the meat, that's still milk. Everything I'm giving you today, this is milk. So it only becomes meat as you begin to apply it. The moment you apply it, now you're growing. That's why I didn't want to lay hands on you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because what happened is those who did the prayer, they grew. As much as those who received. Those who did it grew as much as those who received it. Amen? So, so that's how we have to look at it. We, we don't grow by hearing. We actually grow by doing. You understand? And so that's how we have to do it because uh, this book that you have here, this Bible, is 66 books, right? 64 books were written by Jews, by Jewish people. Come on, you understand? So it's going to have a Jewish slant. 64 of the 66 books written by Jews. You understand? So it's going to have a Jewish slant. Luke is the only one that was not, that, that's, a, that's a Gentile that wrote any of the Bible, Old or New Testament, okay? So in the Jewish mind, you don't grow spiritually by what you hear, you grew by what you did. That's, that's how they thought. That, that was the terminology. That's why they always thought in terms of circles. What God began, he'll finish, right? Or that which I hear, now I'm responsible to do. Thank you for your enthusiasm, all right? So that's which I hear, I'm now responsible to do. Because Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who hear. No, Jesus said, blessed are they who hear and do. <laughs> Come on, right? So the moment you do it, bam, all of a sudden there's where spiritual growth happens. Now, oh, resistance. Ah, you're growing. <laughs> you understand? So you go to, to pray for the sick at, at Walmart and... <laughs> Your heart's beating fast. Your knees are having fellowship, you know, and your mind is racing. All of these thoughts are going, what if nothing happens? Uh, and you hear the enemy say, don't do it, don't do it. This is not a good time and stuff. And you just do it. You step out and you say to that person, hey, I take away people's pain. Do you have any pain? <laughs> yes, I do have pain. And you lay hands, instantly you want a victory right there. Why? Because you spiritually grew. You didn't grow by information that hit your notebook, you grew by information you received and then you applied it, right? And so the moment you begin to see that, ah, now you're stepping out of just of infancy, now you're stepping into maturity, into sonship, right? You're stepping into sonship. And that's where God has the church. Now, not to open up too much here right before we close, but let me just say this is that, um, oh Lord, do I do it? I might as well do it. All right. So, all right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse, uh, verses 1 through 3. He, the, in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual, but as carnal. Then you go back 11 chapters, and he's talking about these things of the Spirit. 
So these are not spiritual people. These are carnal people, even babes in Christ. So now let me say it to you like this. Are you ready for a whopper? Okay. Gifts are not for adults. Gifts are for children. Help us all. <laughs> gifts are, are for children. At Christmas time, who gets excited for the gifts? The children. You understand? So when somebody's all excited for gifts, we also know this. The same thing is true spiritually. Those who are excited for gifts, what does it reveal? That they are children. You understand? So Jesus did not operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus operated in the fullness of the Spirit. The Bible talked about the fullness. I can prove it to you out of the Word. I'll show you. In um, Isaiah 11, there's several scriptures. He actually operated out of what the Bible calls the seven spirits of God. But in, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, is this okay? I know I'm opening up a lot. Curry and I did a conference on this once, and we spoke on, on these very things. But in Isaiah 11, it says, There will come forth a rod of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. So this is all talking about Jesus. You notice it doesn't say the gift. Now you're just going to see fullness. These are the seven spirits of God. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he'll not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of the ears. But with righteousness he'll judge the poor and decide the equity of the earth, blah, 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 blah. Righteousness will be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness will be the belt of his waist. So all this is talking about Jesus. So Jesus did not function in a word of knowledge. He functioned in fullness. That's why in Ephesians 4, he says that we may grow up into him, into the fullness, right? Into the maturity. And that's where God has us. But now listen to me. At the same time as this, is if you're not even operating in the gifts, you're not even at square one. Come on. Say amen, say something, say oh me or something, all right? <laughs> okay, so if you're not even operating in the gifts, you're not even on base one. So, so this is where God has us. That, once again, he has us in training wheels so that we start in the gifts so that we move towards what? Fullness. We're moving towards fullness. We're moving towards fullness into the full maturity of Christ that we would what? F operate out of fullness. Now no longer are we operating in a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or in the gift of prophecy. Now I'm operating in the spirit of prophecy. Now I'm operating in the spirit of knowledge. You understand? And so that's, that's the difference. But, but we got to start somewhere. Come on, right? How many of you want to start? Anyone want to start, right? And so you got to start. We all got to start. And so we all have a starting point. But I want you to know that Gifts are not the end destination. Gifts are the beginning. So gifts are the beginning. The end destination is fullness, is that God is pushing the church towards maturity, that we would grow up into the fullness um, in Christ. So praise God. Amen? Is that all right to say here today? So praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So let's just do some prophetic ministry here now. So here this afternoon, uh, there's someone here. Can, can I get down? Is that all right? You guys okay on the cameras and stuff? Is that all right? Yeah, me? Okay. All right. I'm going to do it. So, Okay. There's someone here today that you are struggling in your breathing in your nose. It's a deviated septum, and the Lord wants to heal you. Who is that here this afternoon? In your breathing? Is that you? Yeah, come. Come right here. Okay. So I'm just going to start with some stuff on, on healing, okay? Uh, somebody else in ringing in your ears, and the Lord wants to bring you healing with that, especially in your right ear. Who is that tonight? Yes, ma'am. Come. Come. Yeah. Come. Come, my sister. You too, brother? Yeah, come. Just stand here. Just turn towards me. I'm going to pray for you if that's okay. All right? 
to stand this way. Thank you, Jesus. Now, before I started, I, I honest to God, I had absolutely nothing. <laughs> I just said, okay, we're going to just do words and knowledge. And I took a drink of water, and I'm like, I prayed one of those real deep theological prayers. Oh, God. <laughs> and then I saw the nose. I saw the, the breathing problem, and then I saw the, the ear and stuff. And so, But there's someone else here as well, um, very strange. <clears throat> Something with, something with your throat. It's like your tongue to your throat. There's some kind of a problem there or something. The Lord wants to heal that thing. Very strange. Is that you, ma'am? Yeah, come. Yeah, very. It's like, is it infected or something? or Thyroid. Okay, yeah. But there's somebody else. I want to say there's another lady. Yeah, come. You're the one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you come. You stay. Hey, might as well get it. God's still in a good mood, so come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Very strange. Okay, this, there's somebody here, I've never prophesied like this before, but there's someone here that you used to work at a company and a lie was spoken about you, and I think you lost your job. Is that you? Yeah, just come right now. The Lord's going to bring restoration there. There's some kind of connection there, yeah. Very strange. You too? You had the same thing, yeah. It was like a lie that was said about you. Yeah, it was a lie. It wasn't truth. Yeah, okay, it's restoration. You too, brother. Yeah, come. Very strange. Woo. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got goosebumps on my goosebumps on that one. All right. And um, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> and uh, there's somebody here in your lower back. I want to say it's like in your tailbone. And it's, and it's like your back, like it doesn't go in. It's like it hurts all the time, but it's really in your lower, lower back. And the Lord wants to bring you healing in that thing. It's like in your deep lower back. <clears throat> Is it you, sir? Yeah, come. You too. Yeah, I felt like it was a man. Okay. So we just practice these things, right? I mean, I say it, you go to the doctor and the doctors practice. So we practice. <laughs> we practice hearing the voice. You understand? So thank you, Jesus. Someone, this is more heavy. <clears throat> Someone in your marriage Things in the natural don't look good. And it looks like everything's coming apart. But the Lord wants to heal your marriage. Who is that? Just looks like everything's just unraveled. Is that you, brother? Come. God's going to heal your marriage, brother. Come. You too. Yeah, come. Restoration. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Can you help me? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, today. Thank you, Jesus. You're bringing restoration. Lord, I just prophesy restoration in the name of Jesus. It's been like a, like a sea of lies <clears throat> around from others. Speaking lies <clears throat> has not added any help. But I just felt like Weeping may endure for the night, but joy may come in the morning. That's the scripture I got for you. And uh, the Lord's just going to bring restoration. So we just prophesy restoration to you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for setting her free right now by the grace of God. Thank you, Jesus. I just speak healing right now on my brother right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Supernaturally, Lord, I thank you right now for... For bringing restoration. God, I thank you for full restoration. Lord, by your grace. By your grace, Lord, I just thank you for healing that right now. In the name of Jesus. Words spoken. Shh, let him just be washed away on a river of the blood of Jesus. Just washed away on the river of the blood. Thank you, Jesus. You and your hearing, brother. You're back, yeah. Okay.
So I just speak healing to you. In Jesus' name. All the swelling, I command it to go from you. I command a creative miracle right now in the name of Jesus. All pain go. Just move it. Just bend down. Touch your toes. You. Just get your back. Get your legs up. Yeah. Speak healing to that now. In the name of Jesus. Be healed right now by God's grace. Thank you, Father, right now. Thank you, Jesus. And you? Yeah, the job. Yeah, I just thank you, Lord, right now for that, that uh, you're going to bring uh, not only restoration but uh, to those people, but I just felt like the Lord's going to give you promotion for standing. That's what I just feel like the Lord is saying, promotion, for just staying strong and being honest. Yeah, yeah, just God, I thank you right now that, that your hand is upon her. Thank you, Jesus. She's a black and white person. There's no gray with her. And so, Lord, I thank you that, that she has high integrity, Lord, and I thank you for that right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you for that, Father. And, and you? Oh, you had all of it. Okay, yeah. So right now, we just speak healing to that right now in the name of Jesus. Right through the nose. Right now, we just speak healing through it. Just breathe through your nose right now in Jesus' name. I just speak healing in that ear. I command the buzzing to stop as well. You in the buzzing? A voice, yeah. Speak healing in the voice, yeah, right now in the name of Jesus. Just put your hand right on there, yeah. Put, yeah, put your hand right on there, yeah, just like that. In Jesus' name, voice be healed. In Jesus' name, come in the voice be healed right now by God's grace. I just speak healing to that thing right now in the name of Jesus. Yours too, yeah. Thyroid, yeah, I speak healing to that right there. In Jesus' name, I command a creative miracle right through that thing in Jesus' name. Full restoration by the grace of God. Yeah, so right now we just speak healing to that ear. The ears be healed. Be open right now in the name of Jesus. Ear be open. Be open in Jesus' name right now. Be open. Be open right now. You can hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Is it better? It's louder than it should be. Is it louder than it should be? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Rejoice with her. Come on. Amen. You? Yeah, so in yeah, is it yeah, so in Jesus name we just speak healing right now in Jesus name. Thank you Father for healing. Who's the musician over here? Who's the singer or something right in here? Too. Yeah, come stand up. God's going to bless you in your singing. Yeah, come. I want to lay hands on you. Yeah, God's going to bless you. Come right here. Just stand right here. You, you, you sing and you do worship and stuff. Yeah, just lift your hands. Lord, I thank you right now that she's going to have a divine appointment. Uh, with something with her singing and uh, when she opens her mouth the sick will be healed when she opens her mouth the sick will be healed lord i thank you right now in the name of jesus tumors will dissolve when you open your mouth to sing thank you father right now for miracle out of her mouth in the name of jesus thank you father touch her right now with your fire right now jesus name fill right now touch touch with the presence of jesus how about you your nose yeah we just speak healing to that